a girl with long hair and a crown on her head appeared through the bright glow. She introduced herself by the name Lerman and apologized for the sudden intrusion. The boy saw a glowing ball of light floating in the air in front of his eyes. In the middle of this glowing ball was the girl who had spoken to boy. Behind her back were wings. The fairy informed the boy that he was dying. It was a schoolboy, 15-year-old Kawai Akira, who was lying on the ground near an overturned truck. A woman and a little girl were sitting next to him. Kawai Akira replied to the fairy that he realized what he was dying. He also said that he had no regrets. After all, the most important thing for him is that he managed to save the girl from the truck that lost control. He managed to push the girl who was crossing the road with her mom. He prevented the collision of a truck rushing down the road with a woman and a child, sacrificing himself. Kawai Akira was lying on the ground unconscious. A woman who was sitting on the ground next to Akira thanked him for saving her daughter. An ambulance was on its way. The fairy told Akira that she was here to reincarnate him. She asked Akira if he had any wishes. Akira smiled, thanked the fairy, and said to her that he wanted to be handsome in his next life. A glow spread around the fairy. She told Akira that she would make him the most handsome man in the world. After these words, Akira was plunged into darkness. Just like that, Akira Kawai found himself in another world. When he opened his eyes, he found himself in the body of a huge demon-like creature with long hair and sharp teeth. Its eyes were emitting rays of light and its mouth was filled with smoke. 11. He felt a surge of strength and energy in his body that he had never felt before. The first thing he saw when he reincarnated, it was two giant dragons that appeared before him in the middle of the forest. The sinister dragons reached the sky, spreading their wings. They circled around Akira. Such a picture made it clear to Akira that this was another world. Upon seeing Akira, the dragon stopped and pointed their heads downward. Looking at Akira, Akira realized that the dragons were not in the best of spirits. He realized that he was witnessing a battle between two dragons who were fighting for world domination. With his sudden appearance, Akira interrupted their battle. Akira was frightened and looked at the dragons in horror. In his head, he heard a voice that told him, Be careful! The dragons leaned towards Akira and opened their mouths, from which a roar emanated. Suddenly, Akira heard a voice that came from space. The voice told him that if he did not do something immediately, he would die. These words frightened Akira. How could one die while already being dead? At that moment, Akira felt boundless power and rage within him. He clenched his fists and felt the crushing power in them. The rays coming from his eyes began to glow brighter. The condition of overwhelming fear of death was fulfilled. Intimidation skill is now available. A unique skill has been learned. Intimidation skill activated. At that moment, Akira felt a power and rage within him that he had never felt before. The rays from his eyes began to glow with a hypnotic light. He clenched his fangs and a wild roar began to erupt from his mouth. Akira directed all his energy towards the dragons. His roar turned into a powerful wave that threw the dragons off in different directions. The dragons looked disoriented and helpless. The dragons opened their mouths, trying to greedily inhale air. The fear of death drove them into a state of terror. The two dragons felt such emotions for the first time in their lives. Feeling the effects of Akira's intimidation skill, their behavior changed drastically. Suddenly, the dragons intertwined and began to mate. On the brink of death, survival instinct drove the two organisms to the spontaneous act of reproduction. Akira stood looking at the dragons. He could find no explanation for what he was seeing. That was unexpected. Akira said, You don't say. He suddenly heard a response out of nowhere. Akira started looking for the source of the sound and asked to himself, Where did that voice come from? To his question, the voice replied, I'm here, on your shoulder. Looking at his shoulder, Akira saw a creature unknown to him. It was sexless and unlike any animal that existed on earth. It had small wings on its back and a crown on its head. The unknown creature asked Akira if he did not recognize his benefactress, Princess Lauermont, remembering the image of Lauerman the last time Akira saw her, near the wrecked truck. He could not believe that this inexplicable being could be a beautiful fairy. Lerman explained to Akira that the need to look like that was for good reason. Looking at the two dragons mating with each other, Lerman asked Akira if they would talk further in their presence. Only now did Akira realize what was going on between the two dragons and was very confused. A look of disgust appeared on Akira's face. Lerman noticed Akira's grimace and asked, what was going on with him? His smile looked disgusted. At that moment, a girl wearing armor and carrying a sword behind her back appeared in front of Akira. She pointed to a spot below her feet. She told Akira that this place is the place of the Battle of the Two Dragons. She arrived at that place to slay those dragons. It was a brave heroine who defeated the Demon King, for the sake of world peace. At that moment, the warrior girl heard the roaring and moaning of the dragons. 
Looking around, she saw Akira standing on a dais, watching the two dragons. She was surprised. What the hell? shouted out the warrior girl. Akira and Lerman, who was sitting on his right shoulder, stared at the two mating dragons. Rays of light shone from Akira's eyes. Akira was surrounded by an energy of fear that swirled around him. Upon seeing Akira, the warrior girl was horrified. Sweat streamed down her face. Thoughts flashed through her mind. Who is this? A demon king? No, something more. Now the warrior girl realized that Akira was exuding an aura of intimidation. She could feel it. The feeling made the girl embarrassed. She began to remember the last time she had experienced it. It was two years ago. The warrior girl sank into her memories. At that moment, she realized that the person in front of her was the person at whose hands the dragons had been defeated. In the warrior girl's mind, memories of two years ago when she and her team had defeated the demon king began to surface. How they had rejoiced and could finally relax for a while. They parted, promising each other to reconnect again. Besides this memory, another one came to the girl. When she, as a teenager, was living in her parents' house, lying on the bed in her room, she was resting in tranquility. At that moment, she turned her attention to a piece of paper that was lying on her desk. She realized from the handwriting that her mother wrote the letter. Next to the note was a personal item that the girl used to like to use. It was her intimate toy, which she called Pink Rota. In the note, the mom wrote that she found it when she was cleaning her room and cleaned it at the same time. Her mom also asked girl to find a real fiancé. The girl was furious. A feeling of shame was eating her up. Now she was thinking that only that feeling of hopelessness when she found the note from her mother could be compared to the feeling she was experiencing at this moment. The warrior girl fell to her knees on the ground. A stream of black-colored light formed behind the girl's back. An ominous voice from the stream said, It's the end of the world. Akira heard the voice and turned to the girl who was sitting on the ground behind him. A hand with long and sharp claws appeared from the black stream. The stream grew larger and soon a demon appeared from it and said that the moment had come when the heroine lowered her hands. It was the demon king. The stream began to expand and already looked like a huge cloud that swirled over the warrior girl's head. The black cloud rumbled like thunder, surrounding the demon king. The demon king said that he would unleash all his hatred on the girl right now, striking her with his deadly blow. At that moment, Akira, who was watching the girl, decided to intervene in their conversation. He swiftly headed towards the girl, pushing off the ground with his bare feet. Akira jumped up to the cloud and with his huge fist began to spin the cloud. Instead of a black cloud, a whirlwind was formed that moved at an unprecedented speed. The warrior girl watching could not keep up with the cloud because Akira was incredibly fast. The warrior girl could not believe that Akira had saved her. How could an ordinary man defeat the demon king? The demon king had been defeated. The black vortex began to shrink until it disappeared into the air altogether. Being in a fit of rage, Akira looked terrible. Rays of light shone brightly from his eyes. There were puffs of smoke coming from his mouth. The muscles on his body tensed up and his hair became tousled. The warrior girl thought he shouted that he wanted to kill her. The warrior girl would not listen to any explanation from Akira and rushed to run away from Akira in terror. However, it only seemed that way to the girl. At that moment, Akira shouted, Mosquitoes! But translating to another world's language sometimes glitches. Lerman, who was sitting on Akira's shoulder, saw the warrior girl running with all her might and asked Akira what he had done. Akira replied that he saw a mosquito pole near the girl and just wanted to chase it away. Lerman wondered, what does that mean, a pole of mosquitoes? Akira answered her that a mosquito pole is a swarm of small mosquitoes and that's what was just near the girl. Lerman told Akira that the girl probably thought he was some kind of pervert and that's why she ran away. After all, what other reaction would one expect from a girl if she saw him smiling while looking at two mating dragons? Akira came to a furious halt. Don't make it up replied from Lerman. The warrior girl ran as hard as she could. She realized that she had no chance against this monster. She hurried to rather report what she had just seen to the Supreme Council of Elders. The girl realized that most likely they were already doomed. A legendary berserk had appeared in our world. Left alone with Lerman, Akira was embarrassed by her words. He said that mating dragons, it's an abomination, but their coitus looks so unusual. He had already admitted that he must really be a pervert. Lerman answered him that if he would help her, he could be anything, even a pervert. She didn't care. Now, a town with small dwellings and a church appears in front of us. The city is surrounded by a defense wall around the ITS perimeter. Akira stands on a hill and looks at the city. It is a city of another world. Lerman on his shoulder urges Akira to go to this city, for there he will earn his first money. 
To do this, he should go to the city guild and register as an adventurer. Akira is nervous and afraid to go to the city, because he is in a new body and does not know how the people of the city will react to him. Lerman insists that he should go to the town. At this point, the town is in an uproar. From the town hall came the sounds of explosions and people screaming. The mummy, covered with precious jewelry, was crushing everything in its path. The town hall building was almost destroyed. People ran out of the building and ran in different directions. That mummy was that pharaoh. Now that he was resurrected, this country would end. That pharaoh took possession of the body of a man named Mr. Zagan, who in his stupidity opened the tomb and brought the mummy back to life after 865 years for months and three days. A man in armor and wearing a helmet was lying on the floor of the museum. In his hands, he held a sword. It was the wielder of the four swords holy style, Mr. Mars. He was dead. People crowded around him and talked about how Mr. Mars didn't even have time to do anything and if even he couldn't do anything against that pharaoh, then they were all doomed. People were cursing Zagan, for he was the one who had opened the monster S tomb. That pharaoh, who took possession of Zagan's body, got his memory as well. Thanks to that, he found a girl named Lily. Lily was a girl with long pigtails and ears on her head. That pharaoh was looking for exactly her. He plopped her on the floor and grabbed her by the neck with his hand. That pharaoh wanted to turn Lily into an undead. Lily fought back but no one could help her. Resistance was futile. That pharaoh was taking Lily's life energy and she started to fall asleep. That pharaoh lifted Lily above the ground with one hand and told her that in two, five seconds she would turn into one of his servants. At that moment, that pharaoh felt someone behind his back. Unbeknownst to him, a feeling possessed him. Standing behind him was Akira. Akira shouted to that pharaoh that he would kill him. Akira looked menacing and sinister. In reality, Akira was just saying hello to that pharaoh and wanted to ask what they had going on here. However, due to a translation error in the language of the other world, that pharaoh heard while kill you. Suddenly, that pharaoh separated from Zagan's body, resembling a skull with a pharaoh's crown. That pharaoh groaned and complained that he was just getting started. Akira's energy began to gradually destroy that pharaoh, and he was on the verge of ascension, separated from Zagan's body. That pharaoh found himself in the same world as the demon king. Upon seeing that pharaoh, the demon king was surprised that he was here too. In turn, that pharaoh asked the demon king, didn't he die in the first chapter? The demon king explained to that pharaoh that they were in the world of the dead. That pharaoh was shocked. Zagan's immobile body remained near the girl with the ears, who didn't realize if she was saved or not. She begged that pharaoh to get away from her, she fell to her knees and gasped in fear. She was so scared she couldn't even move. Akira stood there not realizing what he was supposed to do. He had come to town on the advice of Lerman, who calmed him down, explaining that it was just registration. At this time, that pharaoh re-entered Zagan's body and spoke. He was furious. He almost ascended to the heavens, but came back again. He threw himself at Akira and Lerman and began summoning all the power of the netherworld, aiming it at Akira. That pharaoh shouted to Akira that he would not forget and forgive him. That pharaoh had never once experienced anything like this. In the 5,782 years and four months that that pharaoh had lived no one could make him experience fear. At this time, news of that pharaoh's rebellion reached the guild. A knight in armor ran into the captain's office and informed him that the ancient that pharaoh had been reborn and would do anything to destroy the guild. He also informed the captain that Mr. Mars, wielder of the sacred style of the four swords was already dead. This news horrified the captain. The captain sounded the alarm and summoned the army to move out immediately. At this time, Akira stood watching Zagan, who had been possessed by that pharaoh. He didn't understand what was happening to him and why he was so tense. Akira thought that the man looked very pale and maybe he needed help. Then that pharaoh concentrated all the energy of the other world. At this moment, that pharaoh obtained a special skill, the melancholy grenade. That pharaoh couldn't let Akira strike first. He created a curse. If one touched this curse and didn't remove it in zero, three seconds, Akira would definitely die after twenty-four. Six seconds, that pharaoh shouted that Akira would pay with his death for making him feel humiliation for eleven. Five seconds, something black rushed towards Akira. The something black was like a lizard-like black shadow with long claws and a huge head. Since it was too sudden, Akira was a bit startled. At that moment, Akira's skill activated. It was the intimidation skill. Using the intimidation skill, Akira summoned all his power and strength, aiming it at that pharaoh. It was sudden for that pharaoh. After experiencing terror, that pharaoh finally ascended to the heavens. This time, that pharaoh separated from Zagan's body and left him. 
the spirit of that pharaoh once again traveled to the world of the dead, where he met the demon king. At this time, the demon king had prepared a stew, and he was very happy to see that pharaoh. There, in the afterlife, that that pharaoh reunited with the demon king. At this time, a squad of the guild ran into the town hall building. The captain began to look for that pharaoh, urging him to show himself and fight them. Akira was still exuding an aura of intimidation, spreading it to those around him. Akira's intimidation caused everyone in the guild to faint. Running into the room where Akira was, the captain saw a huge monster, Akira, with burning eyes. A whirlwind of deadly energy swirled around him. The monster roared and waved its giant fists. Around Akira, a squad of guild knights lay on the floor. The captain was horrified. He thought that the monster had killed all his knights. Then the captain told Akira that he would stop him even if it cost him his life. He would not forgive Akira for the massacre he had caused. Lerman, hearing the captain's words, was worried about Akira. Upon seeing Akira, the captain decided to be proactive in pulling his sword from its sheath. The captain was a living witness to legendary battles. He was known as the Silver and White Rhino. In 60 years of service, he'd seen a lot of shit. After becoming captain of the guard, he was the only survivor of the rebellion of Lord Laxis and the bloody battle. But everything paled in comparison to the scene that appeared before the captain's eyes. In front of the captain, there were dozens of soldiers lying on the floor, all of them unconscious. Tears came to the captain's eyes. Among the bodies lying on the floor, one of the soldiers spoke to the captain. The captain recognized the voice. It was the barely alive Mars. He told the captain that it was that pharaoh who had inflicted his wounds. Mr. Mars said in a weak voice that that pharaoh had been killed. However, who exactly killed him, the soldier did not have time to say. These were the last words in the life of soldier Mars. The captain became enraged. He mistook Akira for that pharaoh, and was ready to avenge the death of the soldiers immediately. Armed with his sword, the captain began to cautiously approach to Akira. Suddenly, the captain told Akira that despite being old, he was still called the Silver and White Rhino. He blurted out that to finish off the monster Akira all he needed was one sword strike. Akira then realized that the captain had mistaken him for that pharaoh. Lerman confirmed Akira's hunch. The captain used a sword technique called Riot Dance Melody, also known as White Claw. This technique consists of a single strike with all one's strength. It was the Rhino's best technique. The captain threw himself with his sword to attack Akira. Such a fierce attitude of the Rhino and his sudden strike surprised Akira. He didn't understand the reason for his self-hatred and didn't understand why the rhino was going to attack him. Realizing the captain's intentions, Akira was forced to use the intimidation skill again. A powerful, concentrated stream of energy came at the captain in a wave, but it didn't work on the Silver White Knight. Because the rhino had already engaged in a desperate battle with his inner demon, the captain had been suffering from a chronic disease for many years, herniated lumbar discs. This disease also known as a witch's kick, a long-standing rhinosaur that causes severe lower back pain. Making a sudden movement while trying to attack Akira, the captain felt a sharp pain in his back. It was so painful that the rhinos face froze in horrible agony and his consciousness sank into unknown depths. The captain fell to the floor, face down. The sword fell out of his hand. It happened in front of dozens of other rhinos who had just arrived at the town hall building. The rhino was defeated. Concerned about their captain's condition, the rhinos froze at the entrance. Akira crouched down and leaned into the captain lying before them. He asked him if he was alright. The rhinos new to the scene of the battle couldn't understand how could their captain have lost the battle before even finishing the attack. They couldn't realize the power of the weapons Akira had used. The rhinos ran outside in terror, shouting that that pharaoh was beyond them and they needed to send an urgent signal for help to the Supreme Council of Elders. The headquarters of the Supreme Council of Elders is located in the sacred city of Sinza, in the so-called Trident Tower. Trident Tower is surrounded by the sea on all sides and has been an impregnable fortress since its construction. When news of the that pharaoh's rebellion began to reach the city of Sinza, one of the first to hear about it was a warrior girl who had come to the city to inform the Supreme Council of Elders of the attack on the world by a monster that had destroyed the demon king before her eyes. The warrior girl was horrified when she heard of the rise of another villain of ancient times, that pharaoh. After hearing this, the warrior girl thought about how it wasn't enough for them to have a legendary berserker, but also a that pharaoh. In addition, those two dragons were behaving strangely. All these events raised many questions and worries for the warrior girl. Suddenly she heard a female voice behind her back, which reminded her that the heroine's burden was not light. When the warrior girl turned around, she saw Mistress Halsand. The warrior girl kneeled down to Lady Halsand, showing her respect for her. Mistress Halsand is a tall woman, from head to toe wrapped in a black-colored robe. On the fingers of her hands were rings with mystical stones. 
Mistress Hausand was the head of the Supreme Council of Elders. She pointed out that although the warrior girl had defeated the demon king, but she alone could not handle so many monsters. The warrior girl replied to Mistress Hausand that she didn't expect to see her in the hall of the Trident Tower, and it was a great honor for her. Mistress Hausand was not flustered by the news of the invasion of several villains at once. She expressed her determination to fight them on her own for the first time in a thousand years. Such plans of Mistress Hausan shocked the warrior girl, and she stared at Hausan silently, plowing away her robe. Mistress Hausan appeared in her battle attire. She was ready to engage in battle with any enemy right away. The captain, lying on the floor, heard Akira's question and shouted back in pain. Akira became worried about the old man and asked Lerman if she had any healing spell. Lauerman answered him that the captain was suffering from a common lower back pain and it wasn't fatal. In addition, Lerman reminded Akira about the captain attacking him first and trying to kill him. Akira replied to Lerman that he couldn't leave this man without help, suffering in pain. The captain lay on his back and screamed with all his might, calling for help. Lerman told Akira that at this rate he wouldn't have time to register with the guild, but agreed to help the old man. To do so, she asked Akira to bring the old man closer to her. Akira carefully took the old man with his huge palms and brought him to his shoulder where Lerman was sitting. One of the rhinos that stood behind Akira's back ordered him to let the captain go. Lerman began to utilize ancient magic, applying a Jensinar spell. At that moment, a light glow was wasted around the old man's collapsed body. Suddenly, Lerman said that it looked like she had made a mistake. What kind of mistake? asked Akira to her. Instead of a Jenkinara spell, it turned out to be an Andedna spell. The glow dissolved and Akira saw that in his arms lay a withered mummy, barely resembling the captain. Akira cried out in horror. Lerman shouted to Akira to get out of here urgently. Akira threw the remains of the captain's body on the floor and rushed out. The rhino surrounding the captain's body froze in amazement at what they saw. At that moment, Mistress Hausand entered the town hall building. She caught a rhino sitting on the floor near the captain's desiccated body. Mistress Hausand noted that she seemed to have missed all the fun. Then she looked at the rhino and ordered him to tell everything that had just happened here or she would kill him. Akira and Lerman immediately left the city. Weaving aimlessly through the back of the city, Akira was still thinking about the captain, worrying about his well-being. He asked Lerman if the captain was going to be all right. She told him not to worry about the old man. He wasn't dead, but she added that he wasn't even alive anymore. Akira couldn't believe his ears. Watching the aftermath of the fight with Akira, Mistress Hausan thought about the tension in this guild again. Reina who was sitting near the captain's body didn't recognize the girl who was standing in front of him. Her appearance was sudden to him. He was surprised by her appearance. He didn't understand where she had come from. Her outfit seemed too revealing to him. The tight-fitting suit emphasized all her shapes and barely covered her buttocks. Mistress Hausand looked around the room where dozens of unconscious soldiers were lying on the floor. She didn't understand the reasons for the soldiers' condition and their behavior offended her. She snapped her fingers and ordered them to get up. At the same moment, everyone who was lying on the floor unconscious began to regain consciousness. Lily was among them. A dozen voices moaned through the room. Reiner, who had witnessed the sudden healing, was shocked. What is this? He asked Mistress Hausand. Magic, she answered him. Mistress Hausand used the spell to release their abnormal state. She noted that she was the only one who could use it on more than one person at a time. Concerned about his condition, the captain immediately began to wonder if all of his combat stats had been restored. The captain revived and got to his feet on his own. He still looked like a withered mummy, but he was alive. The captain became indignant. Why was he still undead? The rhinos recognized their captain, but couldn't believe that he was now a mummy. The captain began to complain to Mistress Hausand that he was a human, but the monster had turned him into a mummy. Mistress Hausand was very surprised that her magic didn't work completely and the captain remained enchanted. She was offended. Mistress Hausand demanded that the captain tell her everything he knew about the monster. She was filled with anger and already hated Akira because she could feel his power. Then Mistress Hausan felt that an intimidation skill had been used at this point. At that moment, she had an ambitious desire to compete with the monster that used the intimidation skill. Wandering through the forest, away from human eyes, Akira looked at the creature that the beautiful Princess Lerman had turned into. He asked Lerman if she could turn into a human, as it would be much more convenient. This question embarrassed Lerman. Lerman told Akira that she couldn't take human form right now. Akira wondered why, then Lerman told him that she had a curse on her, and because of it she could only be in that form. To break the curse, you must collect the four rings scattered around the world. Lauerman's power is sealed in these rings, but she cannot collect them while she is in this form, in the body of a tiny, sexless creature. So Lerman began to ask Akira to help her, and do something for her? 
Akira didn't let Lerman finish her sentence. He said with determination that he would help Lerman, because she shouldn't be walking around like this. Lerman looked at Akira with hope and gratitude. She didn't expect him to agree to her request so easily and show such nobility. She realized that he was the only one who could help her. Lerman remarked that she didn't expect any other answer from Akira, for in his past life he had died precisely while saving another person's life. Lerman was pleased with Akira's promise and said that she would look forward to breaking the curse on herself. Akira and Lauerman, who was sitting on his shoulder, looked out over the city. Akira asked where he should begin his journey. Lauerman replied that first he should register with the guild and make some money. Back to where they started their journey to the city, Lily apologized to Mistress Haosand because she didn't know that she was the head of the elders of the High Council, and asked her to ignore her attention to the captain, who was running all over the room complaining about his fate. Mistress Haosand replied that it didn't matter that those present didn't give her the respect she deserved, because hardly anyone knew her anyway. Mistress Haosand then asked Lily if this was the place the monster had attacked, and if she could tell her anything about it. Lily convinced Mistress Haosand that she remembered the monster's appearance well and even drew it. She handed the drawing to Mistress Haosand. The drawing showed a monster with the head of a squid. Tentacles with long and sharp claws were growing out of its body. Mistress Haosand looked at Lily's drawing incredulously. She asked again, did he really look like that? The excited girl began to describe the monster that it was 15 meters tall, had four eyes and tentacles all over its body. Other people who saw the monster doubted her words. After all, it looked very different, but they were unconscious most of the time, so they didn't argue with Lily. The captain and the rest of the Rhinus had no memory problems, and they disagreed with Lily's drawing. However, Lily, who was the face of the guild, discredited them in Mistress House and S. eyes by convincing her that believing the undead was a stupid idea. The captain was all of himself with anger. He still couldn't believe he had been turned undead, and now he had become what he had been fighting his entire career. His credibility and reputation had been destroyed. After looking at Lily's drawing, Mistress House and said that she would call in her strongest assistance. To do so, Mistress Haosand made a snap of her fingers. At that moment, a change began to take place in the room. Puffs of smoke and bright beams of light rose up from all sides. Mistress Haosand told Lily not to be afraid. These were her helpers. She called out of the golden duo. Lily wondered, steam and light were Mistress Haosand's helpers? In front of Mistress Haosand and Lily were incarnations of steam and light in the guise of a girl and a guy. The girl, the Lord of Vapor, is called Seals Nar. She is the sorceress of Zero and Infinity. The guy is the prince of the deadly flash. His name is Bartolius Omega. They obediently awaited orders from Mistress Haosand. A flash of rivalry erupted between Seals and Bartolius. They were determined to carry out any order from Mistress Haosand ahead of everyone else. They were only waiting for her orders. Mistress Haosand was happy to see her faithful assistants. She showed them Lily's drawing and with a smile ordered them to find the monster that was depicted in the drawing and it must be done immediately. Seals and Bartolius immediately set about carrying out the order. With swift streams of steam and light they rushed upwards, demolishing all obstacles in their way. At this moment, Lily finally realized that Mistress Haosand was not joking and took her drawing seriously. Taking another look at her drawing, Lily realized that the portrait of the monster didn't look much like the original, but she was afraid of being scolded and looking silly in front of Mistress Haosand, so she kept silent. Seals and Bartolius circled around the world looking for the monster from the drawing. Bartolius told Seals that he wished he could find this monster as soon as possible, and he was very excited about such a responsible task from Mistress Haosand. Seals didn't answer him anything. Bartolius realized that she was ignoring him. However, he was used to it. Seals didn't pay attention to his conversations because she was watching Akira. Turning into tiny creatures Seals and Bartolius circled around Akira looking at him. Akira noticed them and mistook them for exotic birds. In order to get a better look at them, Akira squinted his eyes. At that moment, Akira gained a new skill, sighted eyes. In turn, the Prince of Deadly Flash, Bartolius Omega, also applied his enhanced vision. He used virtual reality goggles. It was like seeing Akira's face up close in 8K VR. Seeing Akira up close, Bartolius couldn't stand the horror and fainted after three seconds and flew to the ground. Seals was worried about him. She couldn't understand how Akira attacked Bartolius. At that moment, she felt Akira's gaze on her. That gaze seemed to be a gaze full of hatred and lust for killing. This was the impression Akira's appearance had on others. Only fear and terror was felt by anyone who looked at him. Akira became worried for the creature that fell before his eyes. He asked Lerman to help him save this bird. What happened to the prince of the deadly outbreak? Bartolius Omega? Seals became worried. Was Bartolius really dead? Before her eyes, the boy collapsed to the ground unconscious. 
looking at the helpless Bartolius. Seals thought that even though she didn't like him, he was still doing a good job as Mistress House Anne's assistant. Seals couldn't understand who had slain Bartolius even without resistance, seeing the helpless creature falling to the ground. Akira became worried. If it was a bird, it might have been injured or sick. These thoughts kept Akira on his toes. He had to help the bird. Lerman didn't like this idea and started to convince Akira that it wasn't a bird, but just bird droppings. Lerman didn't understand why Akira was so kind and helpful even to tiny, barely noticeable creatures, and to the inhabitants of another world that treated Akira with such hostility, Akira left the bird or its droppings alone. To distract Akira from his useless pursuits, Lerman offered to give him a little tour. Akira was immediately interested in the idea, as Bartolius lay unconscious on the ground. Through his clouded mind he heard his name. It was the voice of Mistress Hausand. Suddenly he felt lightness and weightlessness in his body. Hausand was calling him to her. A moment later, Bartolius came to his senses. He was in the guild hall. In front of him, Mistress Hausand was sitting on a throne. She asked Bartolius why he was alone, and if he had a fight with seals. Bartolius was embarrassed. He answered Mistress Hausand that he just liked being alone. Then Mistress Hausand asked him an unexpected question. Why doesn't Bartolius take her side? Bartolius was taken aback. He had sworn his loyalty to Mistress Hausand. This was not the time to faint. He must do Mistress Hausand's bidding at all costs. Bartolius opened his eyes. He was lying helplessly on the ground. Muscular bastard. He thought of the monster. Bartolius had been disgraced. He had been defeated without a fight in front of seals and Mistress Hausand. He had been mistaken for bird droppings. Bartolius only now realized the absurdity of his situation. He was furious. A thirst for revenge tormented his soul. Seal saw that Bartolius was alive. He was sitting on the ground and angrily whispering curses to himself. Seals could not hide the fact that she was glad to see Bartolius alive. At this time, Bartolius was thinking up a plan of revenge against the monster. The ugly jock had dared to attack him. Bartolius couldn't forgive him for that. Bartolius swore to himself that the monster's death would be so quick that he wouldn't even notice it. Bartolius doesn't just call himself the prince of the deadly outbreak for nothing. He has to prove to everyone, himself included, that he carries that title for a reason. He is not a weakling. He is not a laughing stock. Bartolius whispered to himself that he was capable of striking his opponent by turning into deadly lightning. It was as if he was insinuating his invincibility to himself. Searching for the strength to fight the monster, Bartolius' abilities and skills are the highest magic that only Hausan possesses besides him. This magic was also called the Cursed Lightning Strike of Divine Destruction. At the same time, Lerman was showing Akira the local scenery of beautiful places. She told him about the local animals and plants that were not in Akira's familiar world pointing out unusual flowers and plants. Lauman told Akira which ones were safe, which ones were not, which ones were edible, and which ones were not, pointing to one of the plants. Lerman told Akira that it was deadly. Akira looked at the poisonous flower. He couldn't believe that such a beautiful-looking plant could have such deadly power. Lauman continued her story about the flower. Its roots are quite sweet. Hearing those words, Akira felt hungry. Lerman asked Akira to pull the flower out of the ground. Akira was hesitant. He felt sorry to destroy the beautiful plant. Lerman said that in this world, the weak are eaten by the strong and he shouldn't feel guilty for being stronger. Lerman insisted that Akira pull the flower out with the roots rather. Akira obeyed her. Akira's heart clenched, his hands shaking with excitement. He couldn't kill the flower, interrupt its life. To damage the flower as little as possible, Akira tried to gently scoop up the soil around the flower with his hands. Just when he thought he had succeeded, he saw that as a result. With his giant palms, he knocked over a huge layer of earth along with the flower. The layer of earth fell with a rumbling sound not far from Akira, forming a mountain. At this time, Akira was being searched for by Bartolius. He took on the incarnation of light, completely changing his appearance. Bartolius was a bird of prey with long, sharp claws and fangs. The only thing that gave Bartolius away was his glasses, for he had poor eyesight due to the constant flashes of bright light that he himself emitted. Bartolius saw the wall of earth that Akira had just unwittingly created. Bartolius was alarmed by this phenomenon. He realized that magic had been used here. As an experienced mage, Bartolius knew that magic had different compatibility. All elements are interdependent and cyclical. Fire, wind, earth, lightning, and water each have an attribute, and the weakness of the attribute of lightning is the attribute of earth. At this time, a huge stone flew out from behind a layer of earth and flew towards Bartolius with a whistling sound and incredible speed. Before he could notice the pile of stones, Bartolius was swept away by the rockfall. 
Seals continued to search for the monster that Mistress House and wished to see. Suddenly she saw a column of dust and smoke on the horizon. She wondered what could have happened there. At that moment, Mistress House and felt that Bartolius had lost this battle. The news of Bartolius' death stunned not only House and, but also Lily, who was still blaming herself for giving Mistress House and false information about the monster. To test her senses, Mistress House and applied the supreme magic of spatial projection. To do so, she created a time vortex that was supposed to show her all the event she wished to see. Through the time vortex, they examined a man's body, specifically a part of his torso. The prominent muscles delighted Mistress House and. Those are some muscles, she thought. The captain, standing next to House and, perked up and said he recognized those abs. He stepped out of them again. Now the funnel was showing the monster's face. It was Akira, in his most intimidating manifestation. His eyes radiated brightly. His teeth were like the fangs of a predatory animal. Such a sight could only inspire terror in those around him. The captain immediately recognized his assailant. He pointed his finger at Akira's face and shouted with all his might that it was him. That monster. There was no point in keeping quiet anymore, and Lily played dumb. She recognized that the portrait she had drawn was not entirely accurate. Mistress House and examined Akira from head to toe. She couldn't believe she had found the monster that had defeated Bartolius. She thought about how evil his face was, how unnaturally huge his muscles were, and the veins making his skin look like the rind of a melon. He looked like a real monster. Mistress House and had seen many monsters, but never one like Akira. He inspired fear, undeniably. But in addition to fear, Mistress House and felt something else. Mistress House and caught herself thinking that the sight of this monster was disturbing her and giving her thoughts that the head of the Supreme Council of Elders should not have. What is it? She felt her heart clench in her chest. She wondered if this was something she had only heard about. Is this really love? Butterflies fluttered in House and's stomach. All the colors of this world became brighter to her. All the food tasted better, and all the scents were more pleasant. She felt like a woman, not just the head of the Supreme Council of Elders. She thought about the monster, its horrible face kept popping up in her mind, but she didn't feel the horror anymore. She wanted to think about him all the time. Meanwhile, Akira was horrified at what he had just done, looking at the huge pile of rocks and earth that formed the mountain. He couldn't believe that he had done it himself, with his own hands. After all, he hadn't meant it. He didn't want to hurt anyone. Then he heard a small, still catchable squeak behind his back. He saw the tiny silhouette of a girl near his face, who timidly apologized for disturbing him. Akira wondered, who was this girl and why was she here? It was Seals. Seeing the mountain of rocks, she realized that a battle had just occurred here. Perhaps this was where her companion, Bartolius, had died. She was in a state of amazement. Lerman noticed that the girl was so small that she could barely be heard. Though Lerman herself was the same size, the tiny girl introduced herself as Seals Noir. Seals told Akira and Lerman that attacking Bartolius could be seen as disrespectful to Mistress House and. Akira couldn't make out her words because Seals was many thousands of times smaller than him. Lerman suggested Seals to come closer to them, but she was afraid of the monster, so she preferred to stay a considerable distance away from it. Then Akira thought that the girl was just shy of him and took a step towards her. From the powerful vibration wave that was generated from Akira's step, Seals was thrown several meters away. Falling to the ground Seals was hit painfully. It seemed to her that the monster was already attacking her and she would end up just like Bartolius. Seals prepared herself for the worst. Seals clasped her hands together like a little kitten and cried. Lerman told Akira that it looked like he made the little girl cry. However, Akira didn't do it on purpose. Seals wailed and chided Akira, but all he could hear was an unintelligible squeak. He was completely unable to hear a single word Seals said. Then Seals began to summon steam and wind energy. She cast spells. A vortex of wind formed around Seals. She looked threatening. Akira silently watched her and didn't understand anything. Akira soon realized that the girl was angry. Lerman watched with interest. What would happen next? Seals, having concentrated all the wind energy in her, was ready to engage the monster in battle. She bravely shouted to Akira that he was now finished. Then Seals used a heresy burning spell against Akira. A powerful torrent of wind headed towards Akira. It was a veritable tornado. Seals was pleased with herself. This was the first time she had used this spell. Previously, she never thought she would have to use it. She had done everything right and was already exhaling in relief. At this moment, Seals remembered Bartolius. Rest in peace, she thought. Even though I didn't like you, I avenged you. Through the thick cloud of dust, Seals tried to look for the monster's body to make sure it was dead. At that moment, Seals caught a glimpse of Akira. He was standing in front of her with his arms crossed. A stream of wind passed over his arms. 
Akira was like a mountain that no hurricane could break. Seals was in shock. She didn't realize the monster could have survived. After all, her level magic burns everything in its path. It can't be blocked so easily, but Akira saw what really happened. At the very last moment, when the dust cloud was bearing down on him with great speed, and the tornado was already coming to his feet, some figure appeared in front of Akira and blocked him from the spell. That figure was then blown away by the impact. A stream of wind blew past Akira and headed upwards. The figure dangled helplessly from the wind stream, hurtling higher and higher into the sky. Akira didn't know who his savior was. It was the prince of the deadly flash, Bartolius Omega. Even submerged in the soil, he was able to pop up to the surface to fight back against the monster, but suddenly he was struck by the magic of his partner, Seals. Bartolius became the unwitting victim of Seals' battle with the monster. Only, as always, he had the wrong place and time. Seeing Akira safe and sound, Seals thought that this monster was more dangerous than she thought. Now she will have to use all the magic skills she possesses. Seals is not only good at fire magic, but also at chill magic, by supercooling and supercompression. Seals made air solid, turning it into swords of oxygen and hydrogen. It is believed that under conditions of ultra-low temperatures and ultra-high pressure, oxygen and hydrogen metallize. In the author's opinion, metallic hydrogen is romantic. Seals thought she would first strike the monster with metal swords and then burn it with fire magic. As soon as Seals began to concentrate the energy of the wind element in herself, and cast a spell, the ground beneath her feet split into two. What is that? An earthquake? It was a sudden geezer. There was an eruption of a hot spring that was underground where Seals stood. A washing jet of water, splitting the earth in two, rushed upward. The jet of water knocked Seals off her feet and threw her several meters upwards. Akira silently watched what was happening. More recently, Akira had flipped a layer of earth, thus causing the geezer to burst. Seeing the girl flying upwards, Akira shouted to her to be careful. However, after a few seconds, the girl began to plummet downward. Akira ran up to her, and with his large and soft palms, he caught Seal's collapsed body. The girl was unconscious, examining the face of the girl who lay in his arms. Akira asked if she was all right. Seals couldn't speak, she only moaned. At that moment, out of nowhere, completely out of the blue, Hausand appeared in a bright flash. She was in a positive mood and looked even better than always. Her appearance was like a superstar's performance. Akira looked at the newly arrived girl in surprise. Who is this? He thought. Hausand froze silently in front of Akira. She was examining him from head to toe. Her gaze was frank and predatory, even lewd. Hausand said she came here to see the monster live. After examining Akira from all sides, Hausan thought that he was even sexier up close. Hausan felt embarrassed. She felt like a small and silly girl. She thought about how she couldn't just pick up and talk to the monster. She was very nervous. But then why did she come here in the first place? Idiot, she thought to herself. As she tried to talk to the monster, Hausan gave out incoherent, meaningless words. Suddenly, she saw that there was a girl in the monster's arms. But who was it? Suddenly, a wave of indignation and jealousy came over Hausand. She stared at Akira unable to utter a word. In the rain from the Giza, without an umbrella, he carried seals in his arms like a princess. She lay innocently in his arms, sleeping. Akira gently held her body like a most precious cargo. Hausand remembered the words of one of her favorite songs, Dancing in the Rain. Just the two of us. She felt admiration and envy. Hausand thought about how stylish that monster with seals in his arms looked. How stylish they looked together. That thought made her angry. She wanted to be in Seal's shoes. Hausan lost all her majestic calm. Tears came out of her eyes, a lump in her throat. At that moment it dawned on Hausand. So this is what jealousy is like? I'm not just going to let it go. Hausan's gaze went from admiring to furious. She shouted and threatened Seal's. The head of the Supreme Council of Elders had become like the hysterical woman of their soap opera. Akira kept a close eye on Hausand. What was wrong with her? A pissed-off girl again? What temperamental women there are in this world? And very belligerent. Hausan pulled herself together and introduced herself to Akira. He had a lot of questions. Hausan was blinded by jealousy. She told Akira that she enjoyed meeting him in person, but now was the time to die. Akira couldn't understand why she was so angry. At this time in Akira's arms seals came to her senses. Opening her eyes, she was very surprised. Where am I? She thought to herself. Akira was glad to see the girl conscious. Seal saw the monster's huge face in front of her. It stared at her, emitting rays of bright light from its eyes. Its teeth made a grinding sound that caused frost to run down her skin. On the monster's shoulder sat an unknown creature. Seals was at a loss for words. The monster looked at Seals and said, I'll flog you. 
In fact, he asked the girl if she was okay, but the translation function between the languages of other worlds kept glitching, so everyone but Lauman heard the threat of flogging. That's exactly what Seals heard when she came to her senses. Considering the girl's modesty, her entire body was pierced with fear. Seals fearfully jumped out of the monster's arms. She was ready to fight to the last drop of blood. Realizing the size and power of the monster, Seals realized that she could not cope with it alone. Suddenly Seals heard a woman's voice addressing her, Are you finally awake? Seals? It was the voice of Mistress Hausand. She looked fierce. She called Seals a shameless wench. Seals was surprised. She didn't expect to see Mistress Hausand here, and in such a mood. What had she done to her mistress? Mistress Hausand continued to reprimand Seals. I see you're having fun here. Prepare to die. She told the frightened Seals. Seals didn't know how to justify herself, for she didn't realize what she had done wrong. She asked Mistress Hausan to wait and explain what she was accused of. But Hausan did not want to hear any excuses. Hausan prepared to attack. She raised her hands to the top and began to cast spells. The skies above her parted and began to blaze with a fiery light. Seals froze in anticipation of the terrible end. What on earth is going on here? Now Seals' body was pierced with even more terror. Seals saw Hausan magic for the first time. Scary thoughts began to reach Seals that did not bode well for her. She thought that this magic performed by Mistress Hausan could only mean one thing. Hausan knew what Seals was thinking. She said that Seals was not wrong and indeed, she saw before her the strongest unique magic that only she, the invincible Hausand, could use. Mistress Hausan began to utter the words of the Black and Red Cross curse. Akira witnessed this entire scene. When he was a schoolboy in his past life, he had seen girls fighting more than once. He was always peaceful and wished for all people to live in peace. This time, Akira asked the girls not to fight, but due to translation errors, they heard the word die. Along with that, Akira grabbed Hausan's hands with his huge palm. He wanted to stop her anger and the stream of curses she was exuding. Akira's words didn't reach Hausan's ears. The sight of him mesmerized her. She thought, those are some abs. How many cubes are there? All thoughts of seals left her head. Now she was closer to the monster than ever. He squeezed both her hands with his soft but strong palm. Hausand felt the trembling inside. Seeing Hausand's condition, Seals began to guess the reason for her behavior. Looking at Hausand, Seals thought of the eyes of a woman in love. Is this a joke? It can't be. The expression on Hausand's face told Seals everything. Hausand wasn't afraid of the monster. She was ecstatic. Seals saw Mistress Hausand in such a state for the first time. But why is it so old-fashioned? And what does it even mean? Seals now realized that Mistress Hausand was not aware of who was in front of her. She is blinded by love and desire. Then Seals warned Mistress Hausand that this monster was too dangerous. Neither she nor Bartolius could handle it and confront it. At that moment, Mistress Hausand realized that she was wrong. There was nothing between her favorite monster and Seals. Mistress Hausand was overjoyed. Nothing stood between her and her monster anymore. Nothing would stop them from being together. She thought about how she had always known that love would win out in the end. Chaos and only thought about the fact that all she needed to do now was to get the courage to confess her love to her monster. Her heart, no longer broken by the radio, she can't put out the fire of passion within her for the monster. Chaos and gathered all her strength into a fist, and began to utter the words that were very hard for her to say. Akira stood and listened to Hausand in silence. Mistress Hausand asked Akira for his pager number. This was a huge step for her. It was the first time Hausand had ever asked for contact information from a member of the opposite sex. Previously, she had never met a man who caused her awe. She didn't know how to behave or how to win the heart of a monster. Hearing Hausand's words, Seals was horrified. No way. Mistress Hausand had practically confessed her feelings to the monster. Seals thought that by all means, she must stop Hausand. She can't let her mistress fall so low and fornicate with wickedness. Akira couldn't believe his ears. Just now the girl in front of him was fierce and now she was shyly asking him for his pager number. He decided to ask her again if he heard her correctly. He asked Hausan the question, Pager? However, due to the difficulty of translation, Hausan heard something else entirely. Akira sent her to her ass. Hausan's heart was broken. How could he? A huge, smelly, ugly monster had sent her, the head of the Supreme Council of Elders, to the asshole. For the first time, she'd opened her heart to a man, felt passion and desire for him. But he, a brutal man, pushed her away, trampled on her feelings and humiliated her. Then Mistress Hausan turned her back on all that was good. Darkness settled in her soul. She was unhappy. She wanted the whole world to know her pain and feel it the same way. Then she promised that in a month she would humiliate the world. Hausan turned her back on everything she had. 
she became on the path of evil. Hausan disappeared. There was nothing more for her to do here. Seals looked after her mistress with disappointment. Then Seals thought to herself that this situation was a total asshole. Akira stood dumbfounded. What was wrong with these women? Did she get angry again? This woman's mood was changing every minute. Lerman didn't understand Hausan's behavior either. But she thought it was good that she got out of here. One less problem. Lauerman decided to seize the moment and turn to the stunned Seals. Lerman asked Seals if she wanted to stop Armageddon. Seals struggled to orient herself to where the sound was coming from. When she considered the unknown creature on the monster's shoulder, she asked what's he got? What is he? To which Lerman answered her that she was a fairy. Then Lauerman told Seals that if she knew where the sealed rings were, she could do something about it. Seals understood what Lerman was talking about. Sealed rings? Let's say. She replied to Lerman that she knew where they were. Lauerman was happy. She was one step closer to the reserved dream. Lauerman perked up. She asked Seals if she could help her. She began to persuade Seals, telling her not to worry and everything would be fine. She would be able to handle Mistress Hausand and stop her. Seals was evaluating Lauerman's words. She was tormented by doubts. Looking at Akira and Lauerman, Seals thought about the fact that this couple looked rather suspicious, but if she could use them correctly, she might be able to calm down Hausand, and Seals would be able to regain her mistress's trust. Seals stood there silently digesting her thoughts. Lerman decided to take the situation into her own hands and said that silence was a sign of agreement. And so without waiting for Seals to respond, Lerman added her to her and Akira's hangout. There was a meeting going on in the town hall building. A squad of guild rhinus, led by their captain, were conferring on their next course of action. Lily was present at their meeting. The captain decided to go in search of the monster. Mistress Hausand and her assistants had still not returned, and those present began to have the worst assumptions, even being in the body of the undead. The captain could not leave people in trouble. He wanted to find Mistress Hausand and her helpers. He could already imagine saving their lives and regaining the respect and recognition of the Rhinus and the entire city. The captain was sure that Mistress Hausand, Bartolius and Seals were still alive. He wanted to believe it. The captain wasn't as concerned about the fate of Mistress Hausand as he was about being able to regain his reputation with her help. What also bothered the captain was that the monster might stay alive. The captain couldn't let that happen. Lily was worried about the captain. He had decided to take a dangerous gamble. The captain kept telling her not to worry. He would definitely come back to them. With these words, the captain left the town hall and set off on his heroic journey alone. The captain reminded everyone present that he would not die, as he was already a zombie. The guild rhinus looked at the captain with admiration and respect. They were thinking how cool our captain was. And Lily at that moment was thinking about what stupid things that old jerk was doing. The captain was driven by a thirst for revenge. He couldn't believe that the monster had dared to turn him undead. He couldn't forgive the monster for that. Although his back was gone, it didn't mean that the captain wouldn't hold the monster accountable for his actions. Lily looked at the captain and thought that it would be better for him to really die, to seriously believe that an old zombie is stronger than the head of the Supreme Council of Elders. The Lords of Wind and Light is a foolishness and fatal arrogance. Akira and Lerman continued their journey through the outskirts of the city. Suddenly, Lauman informed Akira that she was hungry. It would be dark soon. Lerman, like a real woman, began to get cranky and pester Akira. She asked him what should they do. Behind Akira and Lerman, Seals cautiously followed. She hadn't decided whether she was with them or not, but she continued to follow them as if mesmerized. Without waiting for Akira to answer, Lerman turned to Seals. She asked her, your name is Seals, isn't it? Lerman also wanted Seals to offer her plan of action. Hearing that the ugly creature turned to her, Seals jumped away from the monster and Lerman with lightning speed. She was still too tense and wouldn't let anyone get close to her. Lauerman noticed Seals' tension and tried to calm her down. She reminded her that they were on the same team. Seals was angered by these words. Seals asked her not to sign her up for their hangout without her permission. Seals was quick to remind her that she simply had information about the sealing rings. And that information is what Lerman needs. And she, Seals, in turn agrees to follow them because they promised to help her stop Mistress Hausand. Suddenly Seals fell silent. It was obvious that she was ashamed of her abruptness. She asked the monster and Lerman not to hold a grudge against her and to get into her situation. Lauerman understood. Everything indicated that Seals had the potential to be a sender. It became clear to Lauermont that they would not get anywhere with Lauermont. Then she changed her strategy of communication with Seals. Lerman announced a cooking contest. 
Akira did not understand. What does this have to do with the cooking competition? Lerman explained to Akira that in their world, cooking had been a very effective way to get to know each other since ancient times. Seals was interested in the idea. Seeing Seals' doubts, Lauerman said that if Seals' cooking was terrible, then she wouldn't force Seals to cook. Seals was angered by these words. What did you say? It was a principle of honor for Seals to win this cooking showdown. Seals asked Lauerman, and did she really think she could beat a zero and infinity mage? Seals started to get worked up. Back in the ancient times, she had only gotten straight A's in housekeeping. She was very proud of it. Seals shrieked, the cooking match? Easy. Seals remembered her college years. She was even called Sweet Cherry, the holy warrior of cooking. Lauerman laughed at Seals' reaction. She had the impression as if someone invisible was constantly switching Seals around. She would get angry at them. Oh friends, then shun them, then share innermost things. Suddenly Seals caught herself being inconsistent. They apologized to Lauerman for their inconsistency. Suddenly, inexplicably from nowhere, a girl in striped stockings and a hat appeared. She jumped out from behind the trees and announced that she was inviting everyone to her house. Akira was the largest of the group, but he was the most frightened. He was surprised by the sudden appearance of a strange girl. Because of the sudden fright, the intimidation skill was involuntarily triggered. Akira let out an ominous roar towards the girl and a powerful stream of intimidation energy rained down on her. Despite the powerful stream of intimidation energy, the stranger only yawned sluggishly and continued to look at Akira with an innocent gaze. Lauerman was stunned. Had Akira's intimidation not worked on the girl, Lerman regained her composure in time and spoke to the girl. She apologized to the stranger for Akira's inhospitable reception and explained to her that his behavior was due to the sudden appearance of the girl. The girl did not understand what Laumont was apologizing for, as she did not notice anything wrong from Akira's side. The girl explained that she was passing by accident and overheard their conversation. She introduced herself as Lucy and said that she lived nearby. Lucy added that if they wanted to have a cooking match, she could invite them to her house. She has the right ingredients and utensils. Also, she'd love to hear stories about their adventures. Akira and Lerman didn't know what to answer. How a strange defenseless girl isn't afraid to invite strangers into her home, one of whom was a huge ugly monster and the other an incomprehensible creature that looked like nothing at all. Lauermont began to doubt whether they should agree. Only Seals agreed to Lucy's proposal without any doubts. She asked her if she had tapioca in her house. So Akira, Lauermont, and Seals followed Lucy. After a few minutes of walking, in the thicket of the forest, they saw a cozy modest house. They went inside and saw that the kitchen was also great and had all the cooking equipment they needed. Seals was happy because Lucy's kitchen had all the ingredients and even tapioca. With them she 6a make her crowning dish and would definitely beat Laumont in a cooking match. Lucy said she likes to cook too. Lucy said that she loves cooking jewels, although she usually cooks alone. Akira didn't understand. How can you compete with yourself? Seals noticed that Ludi had a lot of spices in her kitchen. Ludi inspirationally stated that since Seals was interested in the spice set, let that be the topic of her and Lauerman's duel. Lerman didn't mind. She was already getting enthusiastic. Lucy called Lauerman and Seals cooking match curry chop. Lucy set the rules of the contest. They were that Lauerman and Seals would have to compete in a curry dish that is popular with men and women of all ages. The judge of the contest, of course, would be Lucy herself. Lauermont admired Lucy. To her, she was still a child. However, how much energy and ambition she had in her. She was so enthusiastic that she was giving out commands to everyone. Seals also laughed at the funny and naive Lucy. Sales stated that she would make the perfect curry for which to get a chef's license. Lerman was skeptical of this claim. She replied that it was ridiculous to think Seals could overpower Lauermont's so-called supreme curry. Lucy was delighted. Now that's the motivation she set for the contestants. Lucy thought to herself that when the competition was over, something inevitable would happen anyway. They're all going to die. Seals and Lauermont were still arguing about the composition of the dish and the terms of the contest, not realizing that the seemingly sweet Lucy had something terrible in mind. Meanwhile, Seals was wondering if she could literally make a deadly spicy curry. Akira, fascinated by the upcoming contest, told Seals and Lauermont to please Lucy. However, in the language of the other world, it sounded like, I'll rip your guts out. Which one of them will die? 